All right. Well, um, welcome to my class, uh, or welcome to this class on excruciatingly basic calligraphy. Uh, this is a class that I have taught a number of times. Um, so um, I, I, I want people to ask questions. We, I've left time throughout this, uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, this is not a lecture. This is, uh, this is intended to be interactive. Um, this, uh, th this class is designed also so that uh, we will have a little bit of practical time, hopefully. Um, but uh, first of all, I think that we should, I should dive into very briefly uh, why in the heck you would even uh, care about listening to what I have to say. And so uh, I'm going to bring up a PowerPoint presentation that I've prepared. Um, I, uh, uh, my name is Wilhelm Michalik. I am, uh, I've been in, this, in the SCA as a, an active scribe for 25 years. I was self-taught. Um, is everybody seeing the, the PowerPoint that popped up, hopefully? Yes. Okay. I'm trying to resolve the, can't do the link thing. Okay, so um, I've had uh, over 300 scroll scrolls have been completed by my hand, mostly the illumination done by other people, and most of them done in, uh, in tremendous haste, um, because uh, the, uh, the, the scrolls that are often uh, provided for uh, the various signets to use, uh, we, have a lot, we have a lot more scribes people who classify themselves as scribes who are actually illuminators uh, and who, do, who love doing the artwork and relatively few who are uh, comfortable to do the calligraphy and certainly not to do that calligraphy in, uh, in rapid order. Um, I have been uh, for uh, many years the signet of the, uh, of the Midlands region for the Midrealm. Uh, and a, the, the signet for my baronial, uh, my baronial group uh, I have uh, been granted by the by the grace of several crowns, the Order of the Willow and the Order of the Evergreen for calligraphy. And um, I think possibly more relevant for the, than any of that, uh, I'm the guy that the kingdom calls for when uh, when you get a piece of art like the one that you see on the screen, um, where there is very little space to write and we still need to get in a word scroll text uh, written into that space uh, and still leave room for their majesty's design. Uh, so this, was, uh, this, this is an actual award scroll that was, was given out that uh, I completed the calligraphy on just as an example to, to assure you that I actually know something of what I'm speaking. Um, and that penny is not a a prop penny uh, that was uh, that was put in there to uh, artificially, uh, sh you know, give a, a false impression of of what I do. Now I do a lot of full size scrolls as well, and I uh, I'm actually prefer them, but I um, I wanted to uh, if, if people if you hear hear my name in parlance, uh, either friendly parlance or complaint parlance, it is. Oh, that's Wilhelm. He's the one that does the little tiny scrolls. Um, so, um, I'm trying to remember but, if I was present when that was awarded. I don't believe I was. Uh, well, it was awarded at a festival of maidens. Well, then that suggested I had to have been. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> let's be clear about what this class is and what it isn't. Um, this class is intended to provide an accessible baseline for future progress and for as a foundation for future practice. I will provide my advice on some body mechanics that might assist you in your efforts. And I will clarify the significant difference I, uh, I see and believe it, with all my heart exists between handwriting and calligraphy. I'll break down the Gothic hands to their most elemental components so that you can assemble them at your will to the, to, into a simplistic but functional Gothic hand. Uh, that then you may practice and refine. Um, we are not in this class uh, intending to explore uh, in any great depth what we in the SCA refer to as illumination. 
Uh, that being the artwork and gilding uh, that we use to ornament the calligraphy text that we award as scrolls. We will perhaps touch upon page layout and planning out a scroll, time permitting. Um, but I, 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 I'm not going to delve too deeply into the artwork uh, that, that, goes, that uh, is used to ornament our scrolls. Uh, I must caution you also that without practice, these building blocks that I intend to teach you will not make you an accomplished scribe. You need to practice. You need to build upon what I'm teaching you here. At the end of this class, I, I have uh, the, the firm belief that you'll be able to produce something which is recognizable as calligraphy, perhaps at a 10 foot distance, perhaps not. Um, as we begin, I'm going to remind you that Every scribe, every signet, every calligraphy and illumination laurel that is out there, no matter how talented, no matter how, how, how much of a dearth of talent they may, they may uh, represent themselves to have, all of them started here, where you are now. Having never potentially picked up a pen, having never attempted to do calligraphy in any way, shape, or form, uh, and it seems daunting. I get that. My, here, my, my goal here is to uh, remove that, that uh, hindrance, that, uh, that trepidation. So choosing to make this, this start today is, your, is the vital first step on your path to becoming a scribe. Congratulations. Welcome to the, to the practice. Uh, I will also state for the record that every artisan I have ever met, no matter how accomplished in their art, no matter how skilled they, they, they are, and no matter how much praise has been heaped upon it, is their own worst critic. Uh, I have seen calligraphers who have, have presented scrolls that uh, they, th they've actually been weeping in stress over uh, to the crown for, for signature and moments before they were contemplating tearing it apart because it wasn't up to their standards. And the work was gorgeous, gorgeous. Um, we're, going to try and do, we're going to try and remove that hindrance as well. Um, and as the first step in that, on that path, I'm going to paraphrase, paraphrase the wisdom of Bob Ross. Uh, we don't make mistakes, we only make happy accidents. Uh, I'm going to add my own corollary to, uh, to Master Ross's uh, statement, and that is that the difference between an accident and art is intent and practice. So uh, I hope that everybody's ready to begin, uh, and we are going to get started um, on the, uh, the basics here. So what is the difference between handwriting and calligraphy? The principal difference is that handwriting primarily uses the small muscles of your hand uh, rather than the larger muscles of the arms and shoulders. If you've ever had to nurse a hand cramp after taking notes in a class or, uh, or trying to do or, or, or doing calligraphy, you may understand why this might be. We have far fewer muscular resources, energy resources in our hands, in these tiny little muscles than we will ever have in our arms and our shoulders. And as such, they get depleted much more readily and then you end up feeling fatigued. Um, but we can learn something about this uh, from historical record. And, I, uh, and so um, I'm gonna present to you some, photo, some, some pictures of historical account or historical documents that show uh, scribes at work. One thing that you may notice about them is that very few of them are crouched over the over a flat surface, a flat horizontal surface. Uh, very, very few of them are showing poor posture. Uh, most of them, their backs are relatively straight. They're working in an angled surface upright. And most critically, you may notice that, that none of them are resting their hands on their page, okay? They're writing from the arm and the shoulder, which is one of the principal differences that I maintain exists between calligraphy and handwriting. 
uh, when we're when we're sitting there with with our pen and we're trying to write very very small all the movement that we are doing for handwriting is done with these these little movements of the fingers and there and you can get very precise with this i don't want to eliminate that as a tool for you but for calligraphy we can write from our arm and our shoulder and i'm going to be demonstrating in this class how that is done um, so that we can set ourselves up for success um, so one other aspect to uh, to the, the scribal uh, the, the calligraphy uh, efforts that uh, you see in some of these these photos that I'm showing showing you are that you'll notice that the the, the scribes are not smearing their work as they're as they're running their their hands across the page or as they're running their pens across the page they're not smearing their work with the heel of their hands they're not, they don't they don't have a big blob blob of ink on the heel of their hand um we don't have that same problem here with with uh, calligraphy um and that comes that that is that is body mechanics uh, calligraphy is done primarily, for, I think, from the from the arms and the shoulders. Uh, all that our hands and fingers are needed to do is hold the pen at the same angle. Uh, we do not have to hold our pen in a death grip, as if somebody's going to come by and grab it out of our hands and steal it from us. Um, if we are, if, if we're practicing calligraphy, this should be a relaxing practice. This. Uh, we should be able, you should be able to, if somebody wanted to, that somebody should be able to walk up and, and literally pluck the, the pen out of your hand. Um, and I've done this with several of my, uh, of my direct students um, to, to break them of the bad habit that we develop as handwriters, uh, that, we, that we clench our fingers around that pen. And I think everybody that, that has ever attended a school where handwriting is a, a factor in note taking, uh, some of us older students in particular, uh, remember the, the white knuckle grip that, uh, that, that, that uh, your fellow students had upon their pens and perhaps that we did as well. Um, so how do we get ourselves prepared to do calligraphy? So these, these pictures of, uh, of medieval scribes that are up here show a, a relatively typical workstation, um, and we're and, and we're looking at an angled desk um, and at a various ornamentation. I am not in any way advocating that you need to get yourself a ornate medieval style desk. You can do the same thing with a with a plank and a couple of books, and I've done that before. You can likewise do it with a lap desk. Um, the trick, though, is to not be is, is to be able to, to maintain your posture, to be able to sit more or less straight up, perhaps not quite as straight up as uh, this individual on the uh, this individual in the woodcut. Um, but I will comp I, I will compliment that individual on his posture. Um, if you if you're standing if you're sitting straight up or uh, or as if you were writing at a chalkboard, you're setting yourself up for a posture that is not only going to be suitable for long bouts of writing, but as a lot of us calligraphers do, but also where you're not going to walk away from that feeling as if your back is about to give out and your and as if your uh, your hand is about to fall off. Um, so. I want you to think about the about setting up your workspace so that you that you would uh, give yourself the best chance to succeed, uh, because especially at this critical early stage in your calligraphy development, uh, the last thing we want is a bad experience. The last thing we want is somebody to walk away from 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 their calligraphy and say, my hand hurts, my arms hurt, my shoulders hurt, uh, my back hurts. I'm never doing this again. This was miserable. We don't want that to happen. So I want to I want to help you try and relieve some of that fatigue and stress uh, by em emphasizing and assist and uh, uh, insisting upon uh, proper posture. Sit upright at your workspace. Hold your pen lightly in your fingers so that if somebody was to come up behind you, they could grab it out of your hand with minimal resistance. If your hand is resting on your work surface, lean back and, and move your work surface a little bit back and away from you. And, now, and then you're ready to begin. 
Now we're going to look at the at, at the principal tool, pens. Uh, I do not care whether you use a modern pen, a period pen, a quill. Doesn't matter to me. And honestly, it doesn't matter to anybody except for the highest echelons of the ANS communities. Uh, and that is only if you are if you are saying to join them in the rarefied air of the cal uh, of the calligraphy and illumination laurels. Um, I use a modern a modern dip pen, um, speedball uh, C5 nib on uh, on a plastic holder. Uh, I have also used uh, manuscript uh, cartridge pens. I have used quills. I have used bamboo. Um, I have used glass, um, I, but when I am writing and when I when I am uh, performing the the art that I I try to do for on behalf of the kingdom and the society, um, my go to pens are the ones that I can rely upon, and there is a reason why over centuries of development of these tools that we have gone to metal. It's reliable. It's easy to clean. You don't have to worry about it breaking or snapping off. You don't have to worry about having to resharpen it to, to, to regain an edge. Um, a few passes of a metal nib across the whetstone and it is, it is as sharp as you will ever need it to be. Um, but the, the, the principal thing I want you to look at is the, uh, the, the chisel tip, probably most obvious on this bamboo pen, um, but um, also on the on the pens in the center, you you'll notice that there is a chisel tip. That chisel tip, more than anything else, is going to assist you in getting the thicks and thins that um, that most people, when they look at a, a piece of scribal work, uh, characterize as being emblematic of calligraphy. Um, they they can produce the the, the pen strokes that look most like um, the Italian noodle named penne after the same tool. Um, so does anybody have any questions yet? Nothing yet. Okay. So now I'm going to step over and we're gonna do a, a, a quick practical and I'm going to um, stop sharing this screen and change cameras. Yeah, didn't I didn't think that when I started today that I was going to have a multi-camera shoot, but lo and behold, here we go. All right, so basic Gothic calligraphy is very very simple uh, and direct. I do not have a pen that that I can use to, to adequately reflect that chisel tip, so I'm using two. I've got two markers that have been put together. Uh, taped together so that I can have something that approximates that that flat chisel tip. Okay, for those who are practicing along, um, when you when you touch the pen to the paper, that is the first big decision that Bob Ross would tell you that you you are making in the effort of being a calligrapher. And I want you to touch that pen to the paper at a forty five degree angle to the vertical. So. If this is the if this is the nib of my pen and the chisel tip is as as I have it, when I touch the pen to the paper, I should have a pen. Uh, I should have a, a mark on my page that approximates a forty five degree angle to the vertical. Can everybody see that on uh, on the whiteboard? I pinned you, so hopefully you are spotlighted and a little bit better visibly right now. Okay. Yep, that's great. All right, so the first pen stroke that uh, that is a, a basic to the the Gothic hand, and honestly to most uh, most of the the angular Germanic style hands uh, that that are so popular in the society, um, is this narrowest stroke. So if we touch the pen to the paper and we have our forty five degree angle, and we draw down into the down and to the left. We will produce a pen stroke that uh, that looks like just an elongated pen touch. And the ink will drag along with us. Okay. 
Likewise, if we take the pen and we put the pen down to the paper in that same 45 degree angle, and we drag down and to the right, letting, gra letting the gravity of our, and the weight of our own arm guide the pen down rather than having to force our, our, our pen to move across the paper, we will create a stroke that resembles a rectangle. Uh, hopefully everybody can see that. Mm -hmm. Okay. The third critical pen stroke that we have for uh, calligraphy is uh, the vertical. And again, we touch the pen to the paper at 45 degrees and we just let the weight of our own arm carry us straight down in a vertical stroke. And that is our vertical. Now with these, with these pen strokes, we can produce reliably, and you'll see that on the handout that our good chancellor has shared uh, in the chat. Um, with these pen strokes, we can produce the vast majority of Gothic lettering. Now, I'm not saying that this is this is an ornamental hand. This is basic bare bones. But the goal of this class, again, is to demystify and uh, and, and uh, make make approachable this uh, this calligraphy. So I'm going to prove to you that we can make something that approximates a Gothic hand, a, a letter in the Gothic hand with just these three pen strokes. And here is, here is my, the proof of what I am saying. Narrow stroke, vertical, wide stroke, wide stroke, vertical, narrow. There's a Gothic O. Simple as could be three pen strokes. Okay, so as we are, um, as we're going forward, um, and uh, as you're practicing, this is one of the exercises that when I have when I have formal students that I have them go back to if they're starting to have difficulty remembering how to execute a Gothic hand. Remember that it's based on a hexagon, uh, and that these three pen strokes all at a 45 degree angle to the vertical, all with the pen touching the paper at a 45 degree angle to the vertical, will produce this letter. Okay. Now, an O is, is certainly a serviceable letter, but it is not by any means the only letter in the in the Greek or in the Gothic alphabet. So again, I'm going to show you that that we are the lessons that we are learning here are applicable towards more than just one letter of the alphabet. And there's your A. Wide, vertical, wide, narrow, wide, vertical, narrow. There's your B. Narrow, vertical, wide, narrow, wide. There's your vertical C, and now you have your ABCs. Okay. Now, I hope that nobody sees this as being too difficult or or, or threatening. Um, this is and, and the the alphabet that is on the handout, which I encourage you to use to make as many copies of as you wish. And if you wish to, you can use this as a tracing guide because uh, it's ba based off of this exact same format. Um, you can produce these letters with relative ease and it continues in the same way. So D, E, and so on. Now you'll notice again, because of body mechanics, I am not resting my my hand on on the whiteboard. I am not I, I'm not stressing out. I'm not I don't have a death grip on the pen. All I'm using that pen to do is to hold position for that that pen to be 
touching the paper at a 45 degree angle without altering its angle. That's all I'm doing. I'm not doing any funky pen twists. I'm not doing any 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 uh, any mystical movements. This is this is uh, the, about as basic and bare bones as you are likely to find. So now I'm going to show you the first variation, and the, that first variation is quite simply that we are going to add a horizontal stroke. And it's done the exact same way. Okay. That's good. At a 45 degree angle uh, with your uh, with the pen touch producing the letter. Nothing too mystical here, nothing too difficult. Um, if anybody has any questions at any point, please don't hesitate to ask. Well, you know me, I've got a smart ass question. Go for it. You haven't figured out how to make an F yet with it, have you? An F? Yes, F. S. Yes, as a matter no, of not fact. Not an S that like Baton, like the, the 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 letter in my name that I can't do in calligraphy in your calligraphy class. The thorn. The F E T H. Oh. Um okay. So Looking pretty good, actually. All right, so you just spell out F. Okay, that's the easiest way. It is. It is an easy way to do it. Um, there's a lot of conjoined letters in uh, in uh, period references, and I don't want to get to overcomplicate. Um, how those tend to tend to be framed, but um, one of the most common ones is yeah, the literature. A that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, that's a, a relatively common conjoined letter, um, but again, it is a relatively rare thing outside of. Uh, outside of the, the, the scribal communities. And therefore, since this is intended to be basic and bare bones, yep. I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on it. Thank um, you. I appreciate the time you did. Oh, no, no, that, that's it's perfectly fine. I want, I, I would like uh, and appreciate your questions. So um, now that D that's up there, um, I've, I used that for, for a number of years when I was when I was teaching myself how to do calligraphy. Uh, which um, I'm going to I'm going to briefly divert into why I learned calligraphy. I wanted to learn calligraphy from having read Tolkien's work and seeing the markings on the sides of the maps at the front of his books. That was my whole motivation for learning calligraphy. And of course, Tolkien used a more uh, a less gothic version and a much more uh, unseal sort of sort of hand. So I was denied the whole reason why I started learning calligraphy. Um, but uh, the, 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 the little book that came in the, in the $5 calligraphy kit that, that I got for Christmas one year uh, guided me through a bunch of these basic hands and got me on the path of trying to figure out how they worked. Okay. Now, one thing that I can say for those who are more interested in an unseal style hand is that the same basic, uh, the same basic rule can apply. If you're wanting to do an unseal A, you start off with the pen touching the paper at a 45 degree angle. And you can do the exact same things that you were doing with with Gothic, you can, following the same basics, but Unseal is based off of circles. Mm -hmm. So when you do Unseal,
you have a lot more sweeping curves yeah. to your letters. That that D is almost the F. And in, and and quite a few of the um, of the unseal letters are often used as majuscules on scrolls. So you see those quite commonly. But again, this is um, we're we're looking ideally towards demystifying calligraphy. And here I've done the first six letters of both alphabets. Mm -hmm. Um, and while I have done this numerous times and have had a lot of practice, am I doing anything that I have broken my own rules for either for posture or for the basic, the, the basic strokes of the pen? No, because calligraphy is a, a is a matter of repetitive practice. And while you may think or, or, or you may consider that this is just uh, something that uh, people, people do after decades of practice. Uh, I'm going to throw out my first challenge here. And that first challenge is I would like anybody who is uh, in this class and who has, um, who actually has the tools in front of them um, to attempt to write their name. And you can use the handout as a guide, but I'm going to show you, for example, um, how our good chancellor's name would be written. I don't have a calligraphy pen on me. Sorry. No, that's fine. Almost broke my own rule. I do love that double marker thingy. It kind of helps me visualize how the calligraphy pen should be working. Mm -hmm. And that's why I use it. Now, if I was to twist the pen in any way, shape, or form, it would be very obvious that I was doing so. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing. I'm liking that. Very cool. Okay, so I'm following the same basic rules. I'm not doing any any again any funky pen twists or any uh, anything arcane. This is simply following the basic rules of the hand, and I'm using by and large the same strokes, the same three to four strokes that we have: a vertical, a horizontal, the widest stroke that the pen nib can do, and the narrowest stroke that the pen nib can do all of them with the pen nib touching the paper at a 45 degree angle to the vertical. Yep. That's it. That's the Gothic hand. Um, all that majuscules are is bigger versions of the minuscules in a lot, in a lot of cases, or oftentimes in, uh, in calligraphy parlance, you, here we go. Very nice. Very nice. Hold on. I'm going to switch to put it back up. I'm going to switch the view real quick. So it's in there in the video. Very nice. And Bravo. Back, back to Wilhelm. So <clears throat> not mystifying at all, not difficult at all. Helen, would you agree? I'm going to I'm going to put you on the uh, on the on, on the spot here for a moment. No, the way you break it down is it's it's like uh, it's the keys to the kingdom. Well done. It is just brilliant. So the, 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 uh, the hope here is that as more and more people realize just how simple this is, um, I'm, I'm getting on in years and I would really like to, to be able to enjoy uh, my calligraphy uh, my, or my, my SCA life outside of a scribal room uh, occasionally. So the goal here is to get more people demystified on calligraphy and realizing how easy and fun this can be so that they start doing it themselves. And we end up building up that supply of scribes in the, in the mid realm and in other kingdoms. And we now have this huge army 
of scribes who can churn out award scrolls so that we can recognize all of the amazing and worthy works that all of our people are doing every single day in the society so that we can thus uh, expand and uh, expand upon what we know. Excuse me just a moment. I'm going to step off camera. I need to mm -hmm. get some uh, some glass cleaner here. Yep. My little wipe was depleted and I need to clean off the whiteboard. So anytime you want to join us in the brewer's tent, just let us know. Uh, after after some marathon sessions as a scribe, I have on occasion con contemplated doing exactly that. And then invariably, uh, it's 10 minutes before court and uh, and the signet walks in and says, their majesty's just added two items to the to the list. <laughs> well, no, we well, want to retire from uh, the scribal room you can, you can come hang out with us and our little beasties. So. Um, so what we've got here is uh, is the basic puzzle pieces to our to mm. to Gothic calligraphy. You uh, and and uh, the students that uh, the 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 students are showing just how skilled that they can be with just a couple of basic tools. Excellent. I'm very proud. Now, when we're when we're when we're doing this more more frequently, we're going to get practiced at it. And now I'm going to start showing you some of the, the variations and and uh, and and weirdnesses that I've come up with as my hand evolved from what I was taught in the little two-page booklet that Schaefer included with their five-dollar calligraphy pen set. So I don't do the D the way that uh, or the A the way that I I have on my page. I've I've evolved that hand a bit so that. I can, um, I've personalized it with practice so that I have something that I'm a little bit more proud of. For one thing, I've cut off the narrow end on my C. I don't carry that up any longer. I've borrowed from the unsealed D. Sweet. Yeah, I like that. My E. I actually carry out into a cross piece. I have on occasion done my F in the same way. But there's a there's a problem as you as you start experimenting, you start finding that you that your letters start looking this looking uh, too much like other letters. So for example, that F. That I've drawn there can very quickly look like a version of the R that I've done. Mm -hmm. And that can in turn look very much like the P. Mm -hmm. And then on a text which is designed, which, which Gothic if, at its strength is designed for efficiency and, and, being, and, and using space efficiently on a page, suddenly you have a, a, a piece of text that is almost illegible. And I'm going to give you the, 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 uh, one of the, the best examples I can give you with regards to how Gothic hand at its best can become largely in, Ill, illegible by doing exactly what you're supposed to do with this hand. And I'm going to use only a word that um, I have uh, used on a number of times, a number of occasions in my professional life. Wow. Yeah, I can see that's a problem. <laughs> okay, so this this word minimum 
by doing exactly what the Gothic hand is best at, which is using space efficiently, which is not what Unseal does particularly well, we end up with a word that looks like a bunch of vertical lines. Mm -hmm. And comes close to being illegible. Now, we don't want our text to be illegible. We want people to be able to read it. And uh, as I showed you in that uh, in, in my resume page, um, something that I'm known for is writing very, very, very excruciatingly small. So um, when I'm trying to write small, I, uh, I make a special effort to uh, enhance my legibility as much as I can by not using Gothic. Um, when I'm writing small, I tend to go to unseal. Uh, there's a lot more scrolls that are, are executed in, in unseal. And as such, um, they are, um, it, it helps if you can follow that text along in the same, same vein, mm -hmm. but just bear in mind that unseal is not as space friendly because of all the circles. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions at this point? Not a question, but a uh, just to introduce a comment that you had uh, given to me earlier mm -hmm. is um, so you were talking about personalizing your script, and that's not unusual. Um, that you we can some sometimes identify the actual scribe uh, in manuscripts by yep. the personalization touches they have put on their on their calligraphy. Right. Yes. And uh, actually, that brings me to uh, one of the final points that I wanted to make. Um, so since we only have a few more minutes, how do how do scribes, uh, how did scribal work evolve? How did the various hands evolve? We can look at the historical record and we can see that uh, and I'm going to step away from this camera and back to the one that I can look at people in the eye with. Um, <laughs> So when, uh, when we look at, the, at these hands and we look at them in, in scholarly works, one of the things we will see is Gothic hand, 15th to 16th century German. Um, Unseal, um, 5th to 6th century uh, Celtic. How do they know this? Why do these things exist? Why do these things exist in this way? Well, so we have a lot of scholarly, we have a lot of, of, of evidence of why certain things were done in the way that they were. And some of those are cultural and some of those have a commonality. By and large, hands evolved as the cultures evolved. And, uh, and you can actually, and there have been historians who have been able to successfully trace a particular document, a particular book or pages of a book back to a particular scriptorium in a particular region of France based upon the, and, and, and date it to within a decade based upon the changes that they see over the course of that book or over the course of that piece of writing. And I have Admittedly, my it, it's my own thought on this, but I have a, 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 a theory that I have yet to see um, successfully challenged as to why this sort of thing happens. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to use the example of uh, of a scriptorium in uh, we'll, we'll we'll call it a scriptorium in Germany, uh, and we have Brother Bertram, B Brother Adelard. And brother and and brother Cecil. So, brother Bertram has been in the in the uh, the scriptorium for uh, twenty years and has been been working on uh, ecclesiastical works uh, as part of his uh, as part of his worship of deity. And he's a very accomplished scribe. Brother Adelard. Is um, the is the head scribe, the one that oversees all the work, and is uh, is glaring down from the podium at the at the end of the scriptorium, watching everybody scribble. And in comes Brother Cecil. Brother Cecil is brand new; his tonsure still hasn't completely tanned, uh, and he is uh, he doesn't have the ink stained fingers of his fellows in the scriptorium. But he has been classically taught by a master some distance away. And so 
brother Adelard and brother uh, brother Adelard seats brother Cecil next to brother Bertram in the scriptorium. And here is how I think that that hands and scripts evolve. Um, and I'm going to switch back. So <laughs> brother brother Bertram has been doing his S's in the same way for most of his most of his 20 years and that s looks very much like this okay so uh when when he writes the word is that is his s brother adelard like uh, like every other new student seated in the, uh, in a classroom is trying to make his own mark and he takes what he knows, but he writes slightly differently because he was taught differently. And so his letter has a slightly more pronounced serif at both beginning and end. And his S more approximates the lowercase s that we are used to and there's some flourishes. Now, every classroom that I have ever been in and every classroom that I have ever taught in, you will see the students doing this. And looking at each other's work. Now, remember, these were ecclesiastical works. These were books of ours. These were Bibles. These these were uh, scholarly works that were intended to, to be preserved for perpetuity. Particularly the ecclesi ecclesiastical works were intended as almost a form of worship in themselves. You were taking a biblical text and you were translating them across to, uh, to a new page. This could be viewed in, in its own way as an act of worship. So you take it very seriously, but you still have so many pages that you need to do in a given day and in a given in a given week. What I suspect happened is that Brother Bertram and Brother Adelard copied off each other's pages. I can't prove this, but it's a strong suspicion because if you look at the historical record, you will start seeing in the same coming from the same scriptorium, you will start seeing something that looks like that. As Brother Bertram looks at Brother Adelard's work and says, wow, that's uh, that S certainly looks a, a, a lot more uh, ornate, perhaps more pretty. Um, this is the classical, certainly more space efficient. And Brother Adelard recognizes that space efficiency. So as over the course of their time in the scriptorium, copying off each other's pages, and imagine that the scriptorium is a large group of people in a common room and that the seats are not assigned. Yes, for the first point of the first day, um, uh, or brother, I'm sorry, brother Cedric would, would have been assigned to a specific bench, but brother, but as, as things go on, they, they start moving around and they start chatting amongst themselves and the, and, and there aren't assigned seats. So eventually you get a homogenous text, a homogenous style that can be classified to a particular scriptorium in a particular region in a, at a particular time period within a particular window. And I strongly suspect that that is how one of the tools that historians can use in order to classify documents based upon their origins. Again, I can't prove this, but I'm basing this off of, again, the, what I know to be true from, from uh, my time teaching in classroom settings. Students copy off of each other's papers. It happens. Uh, students learn from each other as much as they learn from the teacher. That happens. And eventually you start seeing as, as people are taught lessons and, and lessons are reinforced, you start seeing that solidify.
into something that is a cohesive style. All right, so we have, by my count, four minutes left in this class. Yep. Um, I'm going to throw the flow the the floor open to any questions, anything that you would like me to uh, go back over, uh, approach that I haven't, um, anything that I can do to help you on this path. Ellen, feel free. I have access to this guy a lot. You, you, you're super lucky. Um, do you find for beginners starting out with a parallel pen is better than starting with a dip pen, or just get in there and get inky and? I've used. I've had people use broad, broad-sided uh, paintbrushes. Sure. And a poster sure. board, something that approximates that chisel shape. Mm -hmm. uh, the bigger the, the or the larger, the better, honestly, for, for people starting out, uh, because um, that way you can see uh, you can see the, the, those lessons being put into effect. For example, um, one of my students, uh, it, I'm still trying to break her of, of uh, some of her bad habits from handwriting. And so she'll do this when she's when she's writing. No. Okay. Now she could, if she uses what I've taught her, she could let the weight of her own arm carry this down into a nice smooth stroke. Mm -hmm. But if that, if, if she's working at a very small scale, if she's working, um, if she's working with bad body posture, it's harder to see that kind of thing. Uh, whereas if she's leaning back, not only can I see what she's doing and see and, and see her paper, it's also at, an, at a comfortable angle for me to review. And I can reinforce that practice of set the pen down at 45 degree angle and just let the weight of your arm carry you down. Set the weight, uh, set, the, set the, the pen at a 45 degree angle and angle it to the left, angle it to the right. and you end up going back to those basics. Now, when I was teaching myself, the biggest thing that I wanted to learn, because I didn't have any of this information, I didn't have any, any idea of the body mechanics that, that I've found now are so useful. I was working at a flat surface at a kitchen table. And uh, when I first learned this, the way that I gained replicability was practice. Um, at the end of the school year, uh, I, I often had an extra, an extra notebook left over, uh, maybe even two because I wrote very small even then as a child. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would take my calligraphy pen and I would just do an entire notebook of vertical strokes. Line after line after line after line after page after page after page after page of vertical strokes, just so that I could keep that waiver out of my letter, that lack of control. Okay, and as you get into some of the more Germanic hands, especially the ones where you have uh, catling, and I am not by any stretch a an expert at catling, but as you get into some of those things where you're doing the more ornamental hands that ability to use those body mechanics to your benefit really, really comes into, into its own, in, into its own. Um, there's a, a, a Laurel in uh, Ayrton in Chicagoland that uh, is, whose cadel, whose skill at catering, I, uh, I will selflessly admit to be uh, highly envious of but she's the one that, that actually pointed me in the direction of these body mechanics without intending to, because she taught her class on catering at a chalkboard. And she just used one of those uh, wire rack uh, chalk, uh, chalk apparatuses that uh, mm -hmm. teachers would use to draw lines on their chalkboards. Mm -hmm. And that's how, how an apparatus like this came, in, it came into my mind. That's how the, the, the body mechanics came into my mind. She was working at a more or less vertical surface. 
and she did this beautiful bit of catling with chalk and five uh, and a five line uh, chalk holder apparatus and she did it in 30 mm. seconds she did it and uh, she did this beautiful catled f that uh, a, a renaissance scribe would have wept to see mm -hmm. We learn from what we what we see. We learn, uh, we and and I hope that in this particular case, I hope that in in this class, I have helped you to see that this is not difficult. This doesn't have to be a struggle. You can take what I've taught you here in this class, and and you can translate it across to uh, to applicability today. And then it's just a matter of practice. I would like to thank you very much for your time and your attention. You've been very, very kind. And I appreciate that, appreciate that from anybody who comes as a learner. Um, thank you very much. My, I've, uh, I've given you my, uh, my contact information in the chat and the handout is there. Please mm -hmm. use that. And if you have questions, I will try to be as available as I can be. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.